Hi, in this session we will connect an IO-Link sensor to S1, port 1 of a SIG 200. The sensor that we will connect is a WTT4 part number 1097190. We will use the Ethernet connection from port P1 on the unit for configuration. Here you can see the SIG 200 powered up and booted. Immediately to the right of port S1 is port S2. This port we will configure as a simple discrete output. Ports S3 and ports S4 will not be used. A search for the part at the SIGUSA.com website brings us to the landing page and repository of literature and software associated with the sensor. To connect our sensor to the SIG 200, we need to get two vital pieces of information. One, the document that details the map of the IO-Link data that the sensor provides. This is the so-called addendum to operating instructions. Note that the title contains the IO-Link device ID. This number is a key part of the IO-Link data structure that serves to identify the specific sensor being configured. Download the file and save it somewhere convenient on your hard drive. We will come back to this later. Next, close out of the literature section and open the software section of the page. Find the IODD file that will need to be uploaded into the IO-Link master in order to access all the available IO-Link data from the sensor. Download this file and save it also. Here you can see that I've entered the default IP address of the SIG200 configured in the last session. Simply type the address into the browser's address field and hit enter. This will force the browser to find the SIG200 and we will be able to visualize and configure it via the Supus Air GUI. Next, click on the IO-Link Ports tab and you can see a table of what devices are connected to which ports and how they are configured. For example, as discrete I.O., digital out, etc. Notice here that we do not have any IODD files loaded into the respective ports. This is shown in the last column on the right hand side of the table. Since we need to make changes to this table, we will need to log in as maintenance again and click on the Edit Pencil icon in the upper right hand corner of the page. Click the drop down menu of the IODD repository to see what IODD files are currently accessible for port assignment. Since this unit has default settings, there are no IODD files stored. To upload the file we want to use, click the Upload IODD File button and select the file downloaded earlier. The downloaded file will have an archive file extension. Inside the archive is the IO-Link data in XML format. The upload tool will take either file, so it's easiest to just upload the downloaded file as is. Click the IODD file drop-down associated with port S1 in the top row of the table. Assign the WTT4 IODD file just uploaded to the port by clicking on the file name and then click apply to save it to memory. A word of caution here, be patient while the SIG stores the file into memory. Sometimes this can take up to 15 seconds or so. Click the IO-Link Devices tab to take a closer look at the data available from the newly installed IODD interface. At first, you should see data describing the sensor we installed. Here you can also see the actual serial number, order replacement number, and device ID referred to earlier. The device ID seen on this page should match that one shown on the respective IO-Link Ports page. Click again on the IO-Link Ports page to double check. Then click the IO-Link Devices tab again and you should be able to visualize the IO-Link data available from the sensor. You can see here that port S1 contains a live sensor and here in the so-called IODD view we can monitor incoming sensor data and make changes to various settings. 
On the right-hand side of the page, there are three small icons that will allow you to view the data in different arrangements. Choose one that you like. I prefer this view because I can see all of the process data, including the status of the discrete I.O. QL1 and QL2, and also the status of all the various configurable switching points QINT1 through 8, and finally the live distance value being measured. Now let's open up that addendum to the operating instructions that we downloaded earlier. As mentioned, this provides a mapping of all the accessible I.O. link data and sensor parameters. Here at the top, we can see the structure of the process data for the WTT4. We can see that there are four bytes total. Bytes 0 and 1 contain the distance value, and bytes 2 and 3 contain the states of all the configurable switching points and the states of the discrete I.O. QL1 and 2. As a quick test, I will move the object that is currently being measured at a distance of 326 millimeters away from the sensor. If I move the object in closer, you can see that, indeed, the measured value changes correspondingly. If I click on the Process Data Test object in the upper right-hand portion of the page, a window opens up and will display the various data in hex format. Here on port S1, I read 014F0005. This data represents the four bytes of process data that we looked at earlier on the data map. If you remember, we said that the bytes 0 and 1 represent the distance value, here 0, 1, 4, f in hex. Let's see what that translates to if we punch the hex value into a programmer's calculator. Lo and behold, 0, 1, 4, f hex translates into 335 millimeters decimal. Take a look at the remaining two bytes, 0, 0, and 0, 5. That last byte, containing 5 in its least significant 4 bits, translates into a 1 in the 0 position and a 1 in the 2's position of byte 3 of the process data. Carrying out the binary arithmetic, we have 2 raised to the power of 2 is 4, and 2 raised to the power of 0 is 1, and 4 plus 1 results in 5 being displayed. These two bits that are true, or 1, correspond to the Boolean status of QL1 and QINT1, respectively, as shown in the mapping. Switching back to our live data, you can see the 5 is still displayed and that QL1 is indeed true. If we clear the raw hex window and take a look, we can also see that QINT1 is true as anticipated. Watch QL1 as I remove the object from in front of the sensor. The status turns to false, as it should, and then back to true as I return the object. In this session, we went through the process of installing an IODD file for a sensor and learned how to compare live data displayed by SOPIS Air to the addendum or data map of the IOLINK process data. We also witnessed the distance value changing in real time when an object was moved to different positions, and also the object detection status output QL1 changing state as an object was detected in front of the sensor and then removed. In the next session, we will continue with configuring the SIG200 to execute some simple logic based on the status of data from the sensor and turn on and off a discrete output port S2. We will configure port S2 so that it will perform this function. See you next time!